Our next presenter is Vicky Gargiturena, president of Alvarez Foundation. Vicky was the founding chair of the League of Corporate Foundations, Philippine Council for NGO Certification, among many others. She is former managing director of Ayala Corporation and head of Ayala Foundation. Uh, good morning to everyone. I uh, have a very uh, challenging um, task. I am... Uh, I have a lifespan of 70 decades, and so the challenge is how to, uh, you know, say what I want to say in 30 minutes. Anyway, I thought I just, uh, I thought the um, title of my talk would be Reflections on Inflections. I believe that uh, in our lives there are moments when things happen, we meet people that change the course of our lives or uh, maybe improve them, maybe be, uh, block us from doing something and push us towards something else. And so I will just pick those few inflections that I think might be of interest. Since most of the ladies before me have talked more about their corporate lives, I'll kind of um, talk about that, but also the other parts of my life. I, I feel that there are four guide posts that uh, have guided me throughout my life. One is very strong moral and ethical values. The other is citizen activism. I've always been an activist not the leftist type. <laughs> Lifelong learning, which I think many of the ladies before me have talked about, and passion, passion in everything we do. So what, uh, what are the uh, areas where these uh, four guideposts guide have become the, um, I guess, the strong points in the life I was living? First, in my uh, early years as a student, I studied for 15 years in a Catholic girls' school, the College of the Holy Spirit on Mendiola run by German nuns, and by Filipino nuns who are more Germans than the Germans. <laughs> you know about Germans, they were very disciplined, we were, it was really like we were in a concentration camp, no? Anyway, so in that, uh, in that environment, uh, they really taught us integrity, very strong, no? On, uh, because our motto was veritas et caritate, truth and charity, no? So uh, integrity, truth in everything you do, charity as a m form of love, love of uh, others, respect for others, love of our country. And um, here it was, um, this is where I taught, I, was, I learned time management. We had a little Ilocana nun in uh, elementary for whom being late was a mortal sin. <laughs> Can you imagine in your young mind, mortal sin? So, so I learned time management. I'm always early for my appointments, at least 15 minutes, sometimes 30 minutes early. And I just read a book, or now we have our, our mobiles to um, you know, uh, make some use of the time that while we are waiting for our own uh, engagement. No? And of course, leadership. I was a student leader. Uh, for some reason, the nuns uh, saw the leadership in me. From, uh, from the time when I was very young. So even in elementary, I was already uh, uh, considered as a class president. I was in the uh, editorial uh, post of our little, um, uh, little, little editor. No? And um, also uh, charity was very subtle. Um, the nuns were a missionary order. So once a year, just once a year, we were asked to give up our soft drink. At that time, it was Coca-Cola. Maliit lang na bote noon. It was a small bottle. So give up your Coca-Cola and give 10 centavos to the missions. But, you know, that act of giving up something that you, that you like was really something that uh, was embedded in my DNA. And uh, since then, I've really practiced charity all my life. Now, family, uh, well, I'm the youngest of six children. And um, the one thing I'd like to talk about is my parents died when I was still a teenager. So my mother died when I, before I finished college, and my father died soon thereafter. So all my siblings had studied abroad, had traveled abroad, and very generously they said, well, Vicky, before you get married, I already had a boyfriend then, you have to travel the world. Otherwise, you will no longer have time when you have start having babies. So they gave me the uh, opportunity to travel for six months wherever I went. At that time, wala pang mga internet, wala pang mga <laughs> uh, mobiles. So I had open tickets. I had no reservations on, on air, airlines. I had no hotel reservations. So it taught me my own planning, how to take care of myself. Three times I was almost abducted <laughs> during, those six <laughs> during those six months. And you know, if anything happened to me, my, my family wouldn't know where I am. 
because uh, there, were no, there was no way to tell them where I was going and where I was from. No? So anyway, so I learned really how to <laughs> plan my day, um, you know, maximize the time, uh, plan my money, because I had all traveler's checks at that time. No? Wala, pang mga inter uh, wala pang ATM non. So I was very fortunate in that my brothers and sisters were very generous by uh, doing this for me. As a student leader, so the, my second, so first was of course my student list, that was my first inflection, very strong uh, German um, discipline, uh, striving for excellence, charity, and then my family. It was a very loving, supportive family that I was born into, fortunately. And then the third inflection is citizen activism. Because I was a student leader, I learned to work with many other student leaders, not only in my school, but I was in the, uh, in the Student Catholic Action, where we met with all the student leaders of Ateneo, La Salle, Saint Scholastica, Saint Teresa's. Almost every year, we would have a conference in Baguio, a leadership conference in Baguio. So this kind of, I think, was uh, what uh, planted the seed in me of activism. Sometimes it was very simple things in our school. For example, I was student president. We didn't want to wear heels <laughs> in college because we had to go up and down um, three flights. You know, there were no elevators then. You know, so we asked for, for that. But of course, we, we failed. The nuns uh, insisted that we were already ladies by the time you get into college. But really this idea of having a voice and speaking out, no matter what, as long as uh, it was for the right thing. But I think this um, idea of uh, activism, I. I uh, brought throughout my life in everything I did, no? So in 1965, soon after I finished college, uh, there was a, um, a presidential election, and uh, Marcos Lopez was the, um, one of the tandem, and the Lopezes are kind of my relatives, not, not, the one, uh, not the vice presidential candidate, but they were my relatives. So my family and my whole clan was voting, was going for Marcos Lopez. My sisters were blue ladies. Uh, we didn't know yet what, uh, what horrors we were facing, no? But I defied my family. I decided to support Manglapus Manahan. They were offering a Christian democratic uh, form of uh, politics, a new kind of politics. And in my, young, <laughs> in my young life, I decided to, well, I was going to w vote for them. Of course, I was a pariah of the whole, of the whole family, but I got their little, uh, their children and made them volunteers for me for uh, sending out leaflets and, you know, uh, campaigning for uh, Marcos Manglapus, eh, Manglapus Manahan. So anyway, this was my brand of activism, and up to now, I'm in politics. I'm sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm very busy in the uh, campaign or support for uh, Mar Rojas and Lenny Robredo. When Marcos declared martial law, I was already, I had two children. My uh, late husband was Francis Garcitorena. You might have heard of him. He was the presiding justice of the Sandigan Bayan. And because he was a, um, a uh, protege of uh, Senator Jose Diocno, he offered right away his services to, uh, to uh, represent Diocno against the mar martial law regime. Uh, because he was, uh, he was put in jail right away together with Ninoy Aquino, with Soc Rodrigo, etc. No? So even then, we were already uh, fighting the dictatorship uh, back in um, 1972 when it was, uh, when it was uh, uh, declared. No? So, um, of course, because of the terrorism, and you must have heard of the state-sponsored terrorism there, I had many friends who were tortured, who were put in jail, who, were, who just disappeared. And so we were afraid, no? We were afraid for our lives, we were afraid for our children. Uh, during that time, I had three more children, so I had five children. And like uh, Karen here, and I think the other ladies, they grew up in benign neglect. But they are very good uh, men and women. <laughs> I think our example of uh, a good, good people is more important than uh, just being with them to, you know, I never taught them, I never tutored them, I never looked at their homework, bahala na sila, no? <laughs> But, uh, but they turned out very well. Okay. Although I was a summa cum laude, ha? BS physics pa. <laughs> okay. But uh, when Marcos called for the election of the National Assembly, if you remember, he, he, um, he, dissolved, the, he dissolved Congress, he was dictator, but because there was a very strong push for some form of democracy, he called for national elections in 1978. 
So that was our chance. We decided, we, okay, this was our chance to come out. Uh, no, Nino Aquino um, campaigned from, the, from, his, from his jail, and we had a Laban. That was the first time there was a Laban party, no? And um, so the, the eve of the elections, we decided to, to uh, show the dictator our tour, to let him hear our voice. And the only thing we could do was we did a noise barrage. I don't know, I don't think you were, still, you were alive then. But those of us who were already in the trenches, we banged on our pots and pans outside our homes. The more, um, the more courageous ones went around in their cars, honking, honking their cars. And of course, the, the teenagers put, uh, you know, put fires on the middle of the streets with uh, tires. So that was a very strong voice of protest against the dictatorship. And in the Metro Manila, where Imelda Marcos was the campaign manager, they were demolished. No? We swept the, uh, the assembly, uh, um, the candidates of Laban. We, we won. No? And so Imelda actually went into a deep funk for for at least two months, I think. But anyway, so that was our first, uh, first uh, real um, protest, no? act of protest against the dictatorship. And after that, of course, when Nino Aquino was uh, assassinated, I went full time into the streets. I was already working as a president of a finance company. I was you know, working in a, in a large conglomerate, not yet the Ayala Group. And uh, every afternoon, uh, you know, I was in my suit. I would tell my secretary, I'm off for the afternoon. So I'd go to the ladies' room, change into jeans and, and my, our truth, justice, and freedom t-shirts and go out into the streets to uh, do the, um, the anti-Marcos rallies. So this was uh, a, a group we called AWARE, Alliance of Women for Action Towards Reform. We were all professionals. Many of them went into government, are uh, owners of businesses. And so we were kind of a, a lead organization in many of the rallies. They would put, put us always in the front of the rallies. We would always be in white and, uh, you know, with our sometimes, sometimes some of them with their yayas and their, <laughs> and their cars, and their cars uh, following us with water and, uh, and sandwiches, no? But, but we, were, we were actually in the trenches. And in fact, in one rally, and I, I'm, I'm afraid I wasn't there, I don't know where I was, uh, they were shot. The, the Marcos um, uh, military actually shot into the, into the crowd. And so everybody started running out, and one, one guy was shot, uh, and, she, and he was with some of our aware girls. So we were at risk, but we had our comforts. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so we were, I was in all of, almost all the protest rallies, and when he finally called snap elections, I was the a trainer for, uh, for NAMFREL, and I remember going to one of the Yulo, <laughs> of the Yulo, um, uh, Haciendas here in uh, Laguna, or Laguna, and um, there were two camps in the Yulo family. And uh, the one who was with us in Aware said, "Don't be so noisy, huh? Because our our cousins there they might shoot at us. <laughs> they might shoot at us." So we were we were in a warehouse where they had gathered some of their farmers, their sugar farmers, and we were teaching them how to protect their, how to vote, how to protect their ballots, how to be uh, volunteer uh, volunteer. Uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, election watchers. No? So that was my, my role, training election watchers during the snap elections. And of course, um, when, uh, when we won, when Cory Aquino won, of course, uh, and I remember I was one of those who appeared in one, one, I think only one of two TV programs that were allowed, where we were allowed to talk about Cory. And my, um, my panelists were... Uh, the, the daughter of uh, Enrile, <laughs> Katrina, and I, rem I can't remember the other one, one of the old um, media men of Marcos at that time. So anyway, from there, when we won, I was asked by, uh, some, I think uh, Karen talked about the Lopez's, I was asked by uh, ABS-CBN to be a TV host. I hosted a Bahay Kalinga, uh, something like Para Kung Si Rosa Rosal. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So I became a TV host and a radio host. Uh, ta, um, our radio program was Tanghaling Tapatan. And my uh, co-host was Frankie Evangelista, a veteran TV and radio uh, host. No? So I had a very good mentor. Anyway, from there, um, when there were, uh, we, we, I, I worked for the approval of the Constitution. And then uh, when there were going to be uh, elections, Cory Aquino asked me to run for Congress. 
in San Juan and Mandaluyong. That was just one district at that time. I'm not a politician. My family wasn't into politics. But who can say no to Cory Aquino? So I said, okay. And so my friends all started uh, uh, organizing themselves. And I told them, look, I don't have any money. We are a young family. I have five children. My husband is in government. So you have to raise the money. I'm not going to... Uh, uh, to invest one centavo of my money because if the moment I invest my money in my, com in my campaign, I might want to get it back if I win, okay? So they, they just did everything they, they had to. We were 11 running for Congress. Uh, I think eight of us were supposed to be on the Cory side. So unfortunately, we, uh, we um, divided the votes among us. So I, Ronnie Samora won, I was number two. But that was a big inflection in my life. I saw the poverty of our people. I was campaigning from morning till midnight among the informal settlers of San Juan and Mandaluyong. And I saw for myself the poverty of our people. There were, there were families who lived in entresuelos, like, like maybe this is the height of their, of their house. So you have to crawl in. They cannot stand up in their house. They're either seated or lying down. I went up a, a rickety stairs, and at the end of it was a baby, a dead baby, just there on top of a table. They didn't even have money for a coffin. No, so I was in tears, practically, campaigning for 45 days. When I lost during our uh, like Thanksgiving Mass, I told all my supporters, I'm not going to turn my back on what I saw. And that's when I went into development work. So I started, like most entrepreneurs in my garage, <laughs> I invited my friends who knew how to crochet, who had, you know, somebody who did Christmas decor, somebody who did um, whatever. So we started a, uh, a small NGO called uh, Buhay Foundation. One in San Juan, we, had, we transformed a warehouse into a training center in, in San Juan. And we worked in the um, National Mental Hospital in Mandaluyong, the trainable, um, the trainable patients. No? So that was the start of my NGO world. And then I went into, uh, I, I skipped the lifelong learning, but I'll go back to that. So I went into uh, foundation work. I first uh, worked actually uh, with the uh, Meralco Foundation, uh, where we did the entrepreneurship development, and from there went to Ayala Foundation. But before then, I want to, uh, there's, a, <laughs> there's a gap there in my life. Um, when... Uh, when I finished college, because I took up BS Physics, I worked in the atomic reactor. Uh, we had an international group uh, of uh, scientists doing neutron diffraction analysis. <laughs> Nakalimutan ko na yata what it meant. <laughs> you know, that was long ago and far away. But uh, because uh, I, you know, Francis was already my, uh, hus my um, boyfriend, he was afraid that our children would be mutants. So, because I was working the reactor core, so he said, I think you should resign from there. So I did resign, and of course, uh, so I decided to teach. You know, like most women, teaching is a, is a parang de facto because you don't have to be full-time. So I taught physics, algebra, you know, math, etc. In, um, in Holy Spirit, my, my uh, alma mater. But uh, my throat is my weak point. And wala pang mga microphone nun eh. So you have to kind of uh, throw your voice, no, as a teacher. So finally, I said, well, I think I'll try my other love, which was writing. I used to write, even as a child. I, was a, I really loved to write. I, write, I wrote poems, I wrote uh, stories, I wrote essays. So when we were having um, a nice family uh, um, day with a best friend of my husband, I told them, you know, I'm going to answer an ad in the papers. It said, um, it was a blind ad for communications manager. And my husband's friend says, that's my ad. <laughs> Another inflection in my life, okay? <laughs> so from BS Physics, I went with, to SGV as the communications manager of the management services division. So that was a very strong inflection in my life. And SGV is very much a learning, uh, a learning organization. So I learned everything I know about business there. So when I had to resign because my boss, Bobby Ongpin, was uh, not a very nice uh, boss, <laughs> I decided at some point... Although they had sent me to AIM, I said, the day my contract ended, I resigned. It was in the middle of uh, the month. And um, I went to, um, to the Aguirre Group. 
And then from the Aguirre group, I went into the streets, the parliament of the streets, and then went to Ayala Foundation. And that changed my life. The Sobels are very empowering leaders, and that's another inflection, very empowering leaders. You give your, you know, your, your uh, presentation, and of course I can give it with all the passion I can uh, uh, bring out, and then you approve the budget and he let, they let me go. I had the carte blanche practically in Ayala Foundation. And what I did was use business disciplines, business um, uh, ideas to, to tr uh, develop programs for the poor that were strategic, that would really lift themselves out of poverty, not, uh, not uh, you know, uh, just panaceas. Strategic, sustainable, that they can sustain it when we leave, and scalable, that can be nationwide projects. So one of our best projects was GILAS, Gearing Up Internet, uh, in internet Literacy and Access to Students, which became a national program with the DepEd. So now almost all the high schools have computer labs with internet access. And that transforms a whole generation of Filipinos into um, internet literate uh, uh, children. So that was one of my most, uh, I guess, uh, maybe a permanent legacy in the education system. We also had one for very bright children of very poor families in Tondo and in Batangas. And the other one that I'm very proud of is our integrated community development program. When we move informal settlers out and put them into a, a really nice development. We did that in Las Piñas for about a thousand families and another thousand families in Cebu. So here you see you can do um, uh, NGO work by using your corporate, in, uh, corporate talents and your corporate experience. And so this is my life in 30 minutes. Uh, I'm sure I missed a lot of um, what I wanted to say, but I guess what I'm saying is no matter your background. You know? So I took up BS Physics, but I also uh, was uh, very uh, interested in uh, communications. And then I became a uh, CEO of a finance company, a burger joint, a uh, memorial park, a, uh, <laughs> a uh, trading company. Because management is management, no matter what it is. No? Management is management. And, um, and many of the ladies already talked about what are the skills you need. No? You can use your, your feminine. Uh, your femininity, because yes, we are more nurturing, we are more consensus builders than the men, and we are, but we can also be uh, as, um, as intellectually disciplined and uh, with uh, intellectual rigor as the men. So don't, uh, don't think that just because you're feminine, you cannot be uh, you know, at the top of the heap. So let's uh, all in, um, let's, uh, celebrate our feminism, but also remember that we need the men. Thank you very much. <laughs>